who knows? 35 seconds to go. Nina Archic on these same waters last year started the last day in sixth and had an absolute searingly good day on the uh, in the medal series and came through from six to win the gold medal. So if any of these four know what's possible in the medal series, it's Nina Archic from Poland. 14 seconds to go. It seems they are all on starboard now. Well, that is interesting. With, with all the benefits we've seen, three seconds to go, uh, they are seemingly all going for a starboard tack. Yes, all in starboard. Clear start. And the first riders tack out, that's Nina Archic tacking out to the right-hand side. So we got a split at the moment. And the other two have now tacked as well. So the charge out to the right-hand side. Magdalena Wojciechowska, Nina Archic, Derin Atakan and Zoe Butang. Right, the first two tack on the starboard lay line. Having to uh, just bounce the board a little bit out of the tack. It's quite light winds in places, so can't afford the splashdown. We've seen a few splashdowns today, just momentary ones. So Magdalena Wojciechowska with a narrow lead and with Derin Atakan just to windward. So it's between Atakan and Wojciechowska on the left-hand side. And then further back is Archic and Butang. And it's Wojciechowska that is in the match point already. She's already got two wins. So at the moment, the biggest threat to Wojciechowska is Derin Atakan. But if Wojciechowska, who's slightly to lured, the most left hand of the boards as we see them now, if she can get round this Wimbledon mark cleanly without having to tack or do anything dramatic, then Wojciechowska does have the lead. But a slightly better rounding because of being further to win, where Derin Atakan is the one that's able to tack or jibe first. So the Turkish rider first to jibe, which I think was a good attacking move. And now Wojciechowska also jibes. And Atakan knows that she needs to stay ahead of Wojciechowska to keep semi-final B alive. And some way back, Butang and Arcic. Butang and Arcic jibing on the left-hand side of the course. But it looks light out there. I do think that the early jibe, Mirko, looks like the stronger move. Yes, definitely, like we said before, an early jibe and keep themselves on the right side of the course definitely pay off. It's, there is more wind on that side, and this is why the early jibe that bring you on port, uh, you can keep deeper angle and higher speed. Judging your ley line, this jibe here that they're doing now is absolutely critical. We've we've seen others jibe a little bit too early, which is very tempting because you want to hold the inside line at the mark. But you don't want to be suckered into jibing too soon. So Wojciechowska is the left hand. She's currently got the inside on Atakan from Turkey. So if Wojciechowska has judged it correctly, then Wojciechowska will retain a marginal lead over Derin Atakan. She's performing quite well, the Turkish, the young Turkish girl. And she's going to need to perform well to beat Wojciechowska and to ensure that this goes another round. Atakan, first attack, but closely matched by Wojciechowska, who's not going to let the Turkish rider off the hook. Not at all. <laughs> Third round is Arcic with the purple ozone going out to the far side. This is not as good a performance as we would hope to have seen from Archich. I thought she was going to try a little bit further out to sea, but it does seem increasingly like the closer you are to shore, the better the breeze is. And then bringing up the rear is Zoe Butang. 
Wojciechowska with a narrow lead over Darian Atakan. Atakan ready to pounce on any mistake by, by Wojciechowska. Atakan doing everything she can to keep uh, semi-final B alive to try and force Wojciechowska to go into another race. So they've done their simultaneous tack. Still the advantage to the Polish rider with two match points already. Darren Atakan with no match points. But Atakan matching the performance of the Polish rider very well. Will it be enough? She needs to do better than Wojciechowska. She needs to find something on the final downwind leg to see if she can overcome Wojciechowska. So far, she's putting a lot of pressure into Wojciechowska. <laughs> she is sailing absolutely beautifully. Um, but it seems like Magda Wojciechowska is is up to the task. She's up to the pressure being put on her by the Turkish rider. You can see on the image, uh, Wojciechowska, she has, uh, she's moving a lot the bar. You can see the kite changing um, angle quite often compared to Atakan. She's working a lot with the bar, pulling and leaving, pulling and pushing. More subtle adjustments. Yeah, yeah. It it means that she's pushing a lot on on her foot into the into the foil to keep more angle. Quite a slow jibe by both of them, but they managed to get through the jibe pretty satisfactorily. Nina Arcic in third, still some way back and a long way back, still to go around the women mark. Zoe Butang and Wojciechowska bottom right of our screen looks like she's got a slightly lower line than Darren Atakan. It looks like similar speed but better angle for Wojciechowska. Yes, deeper, definitely deeper. Which tactically is going to put the Polish rider in a strong position as they go in to the final jibe of this leg. Which I guess it will be soon. The, just the final jibe on the downwind leg and then go straight to the last jibe. Okay. Simultaneous jibe. Turkey on the right, Poland on the left. Poland with the two match points. Having to pump the board. We saw a lot of board pumping down at the bottom of the course in the previous race, in the previous semi final A. She has enough. Wojciechowska yeah. rounds the leeward mark. She's extended on Darin Atakan. Wojciechowska pushing hard towards the final slalom jibe mark. Darren Atakan also pushing hard. Nothing to lose at this stage because Wojciechowska is only 10 or 15 seconds away from securing her spot in the girls' final later on this afternoon. It was a bit of a slow jibe by Wojciechowska. Darren Atakan has closed the gap, and Atakan pushing, pushing, pushing to try and catch Magda Wojciechowska, but it's not going to be enough because the Polish rider gets the victory. Magdalena Wojciechowska is first of our semi-finalists through to the final later on this afternoon. And Nina Arcic, well, we didn't have much to say about her. It's this Polish rider this time that came good in Torre Grande. So congratulations to her. Yeah, well done, for sure. No mistake. She played well. For sure, having the Rina Atakan behind all the time was not easy to manage. And there's the confirmation. Wojciechowska with those three match points, seeing her through to the final. Nina Arcic didn't really feature in that race. Um, so back to you after a quick break when we will talk about semi-final. Meet the R1 V4, our highest performance Olympic and IKA registered racing machine.
35 seconds to the start, and there's a high probability, you have to say, that a French rider is going to go through from this side of the semi-final because on match point we've got two French riders, Lisa Caval and Chloe Reville. What will the Argentinian Catalina Turienzo or the Israeli Mika Caffrey be able to do? They've got a lot of winning to do to get past these two French riders that must be starting to think this is a match race between teammates. Five seconds to go and it's going to be four riders starting on Port Tac and looks like it should be clear clear start yep and very good start by lisa caval out the middle of the line also a good start further to windward by chloe reville but lisa caval certainly with the the best start and looking very well placed C chloe reville up on her left hand shoulder so at the top of your screen it's reville on the left and Caval on the right, and then further down to Lewis, Mika Caffrey and um, Catalina Turienzo. Turienzo on the far right, Mika Caffrey down to Lewis of the two French riders. So at the moment, Argentina and Israel with a lot to do because one of these French riders looks much more likely to win this race as things stand. And Lisa Caval lifting out to windward of Chloe Reville. It seems like Caval has another gear, Mirko. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> she just uh, shorted out what was wrong on the previous semi-final. Now she just start with a different attitude and super attack mode. And uh, but she can't she can't let reveal Chloe on the other side without covering her. They are just really close. So. It's Caval leading ahead of Reville. And Mika Caffrey. And Mika Caffrey. And Catalina Turienzo done a lot of extra distance. What looks to be way over the ley line, unless the others have misjudged it. So I'm not sure what Turienzo is aiming to achieve, unless there's been a shift and the others are going to have to tack, which is true. So, so... Fair play to Turienzo. It looks like she's judged that ley line very well. She's going to have to do um, less tax than the others, and that puts Turienzo back into contention. Turienzo could charge through into the lead because the wind has gone really soft there, and it looks like Turienzo, the Argentinian, has taken advantage of a momentary loss of control by Lisa Caval. So what a turnaround in fortunes. Yes, exactly. The wind, uh, they were really short on ley line. Maybe a wind, a wind shift just don't allow Lisa Caval and reveal Chloe to round the mark. They had to do an extra double tack and then to Rienzo. Bit of a splashdown on the far side for one of the riders. I wonder if that was Lisa Caval. I wonder if Lisa Caval's got control problems again. Remember, she, she had a problem in the previous race, and there's something going on for Caval through manoeuvres that isn't working well for her, and I can't work out what it is. But it's, it's playing into the hands of Catalina Turienzo and Chloe Reville, because now the Argentinian who's leading really only has one French rider to worry about, because Caval has, has put herself back after two successive poor manoeuvres, a weird tack at the top, and a weird, well, splash down and then very slow jibe just now. Yeah, it's really, it's really strange the behavior of uh, Lisa Caval on her kite. She doesn't, she doesn't go straight sometime and she had to pump more than the other. But you know what? Despite all of that, Caval has come back very strongly on Chloe Reville. Turienzo has sailed extra distance and is coming in at speed. I think there's going to be very close contact between the two French riders, so it would be good to see how the two French riders come around this lured mark. And it's Chloe Reville that comes around ahead of Lisa Caval and Catalina Turienzo doing an early tack towards the shore. So Turienzo, after such a strong, decisive manoeuver, doing what I thought looked like an overstand of the ley line, that overstand uh, was not. It was correct. And the Argentinian rider sailing with a, a lot of confidence at the moment and doing what she needs to do 
to keep these two French riders behind her. The two French are going out to the far side of the course, which so far we haven't seen that to be as strong. But with that said, Lisa Caval came back very strongly on that run from that side of the course. So maybe there's a bit more to the far side of the course than what we've tended to see. Got a big split now between the two French on one side and Turienzo from Argentina on the other. Yeah, that's, uh, and it's really strange because all the three, they are really spread out all over the, all over the course. It's going to be really curious to see at the end if Catalina Turienzo, she had the right, right angle again, like before. Turienza, you can barely see her kite just, just below the line of the beach. She's just tacked. And has she given herself enough in the bank like she did on the first round to stay ahead of the French? The French actually look quite strong coming at this side of the course, but it looks like the Argentinian might just about hold on to the lead. Yeah, and it seems that Lisa Caval coming from the top part uh, of the course, she had more speed. I don't know if it's going to be enough or not to cross in front of Catarina Turienzo. Well, the benefit for Turienzo is she's completed her tack. Caval still has a tack to do, but it's got really close between these three riders again. So that bid to go out to sea worked well for France and it's brought them back into contention with Argentina. But it's still Argentina in the lead, followed by Reville. And then Caval, those two French riders, both on match point, both needing to see one more race win to get them through to the final. But the Argentinian is saying, no, this is my time. I'm going to get a race win on the board. If she's going to win, she will keep again another semi-final open. Oh, that's a bad jibe for no. them. Oh, Catalina has sunk down into the water. No, can't the believe The Argentinian it. struggling to get up and running. She is up and running, but what damage will that do? If the French can successfully jibe, that could be the end of the Argentinian challenge. Yeah, she started moving the kite, rounding the kite. Just too low and she stopped falling. So now it's to reveal to see how she has managed to... One of the two can close the deal of the semi-final now. This is it. This is it. This has now got back to the French match race and at the moment it's Reville holding the better hand ahead of Caval. So just one more jibe to get round the bottom of the course and then one more jibe around the slalom. Two absolutely critical manoeuvres to get right. And looks like all oh, Reville is through, but Caval, a bit of a splashy jibe that it looks like she's got away with, but Reville then extends because of Caval's mistake. One more difficult jibe to execute. Reville in the lead, followed by the other French rider, Caval. Turienzo playing catch up now in third place. Now the last heart-stopping moment for Reville. Hmm. It's a slow jibe. It's a slow jibe. It's a difficult maneuver. But Reville looks like she's up and running again. Caval also with a bit of a touchdown. But it looks like Chloe Reville is just about to book her spot in the girls' final. Great comeback by Chloe Reville. Won both of the semi-final races today. And that must give her a great deal of confidence going into the final this afternoon. Really on fire, and you can see what that means to her. And Caval, will, she'll be disappointed not to have seen out the advantage that she carried into the day. Um, but there was something wrong with Caval's manoeuvring, and unfortunately for Catalina Turienzo, the same thing. We, we haven't seen Chloe Reville make a bad manoeuvre today. No, no, no. Uh... I think she did uh, perfect, and uh, now we gonna see the big battle into the final, the fi the, the girl final, uh, two Polish and two French. That's I, right. I'm right. It's, it's, yeah. what, it's what we've um, it's what we've talked about all week, isn't it? The battle between the the French and the Polish riders. So much so, actually, that we even had a, a tug of war match between them on the beach. Anyway, we'll take a quick break. Back to you soon.
Okay, now let's take a look at results of that race. The, there's the confirmation. Uh, Chloe Reveal, she goes through. She's got three match points confirmed. And Lisa Caval, well, she nearly got there, but not quite. And Catalina Turienzo, we'd love to have seen her see out that race and get a score on the board. But unfortunately, that jibe uh, down the last run put pay to Argentina's hopes. And Mika Caffrey also done very well to get through to the semi-final but that's as far as she will travel so there's our situation for the boys final coming up uh Cuban Huang he's on two match points he's sailed an absolutely fantastic regatta this week for China Ricardo Pianozzi the local hero from Italy on one match point and our two semi-finalists uh that have just come through from winning their side of the semi-final draws they need to win three races in the final. That's Wojta Koska from Czech Republic and Jan Andrea Stragiotti from Switzerland. So uh, what do you think? Do you think this is this is one that Pianozzi can can do and, and overcome the advantage of Huang, Mirko? Uh, the only things I can do that in this kind of condition, really six, eight knots, uh, Pianozzi, uh, it can be really close to Kibing. And uh, I would also keep attention to Stragiotti on this kind of condition. We see him on the light wind going quite fast. So it's going to be interesting to see who is going to get first on the boys' final. OK, uh, we've got just over five minutes to go. Um, we're, we're seeing increasingly transferable skills uh, across different elements of the sailing world with foiling in the America's Cup, Sail GP, other Olympic classes. Um, let's hear from one rider who's been across a lot of different parts of the sport. That's uh, Flo Trittle from Spain. Man of talents, uh, recent uh, medalist in the world championships in the 49er is new class uh nacra 17 in the olympics and sail gp as well and he used to be a kite foiler what took you away from this amazing world Flo? good question eh? it's i come back and it's really amazing so yeah it was four years since i last time came here and probably what took me away is that back then it wasn't olympic right and now it is so maybe we'll see you back but <laughs> no um... i don't think so <laughs> How transferable are the skills? How useful was this to take into your NACRA campaign and now sell GP, for example? Yeah, for sure. I think the, the kite surfing class has been leading with other classes, has been pioneering the, the transition from not foiling to foiling. And yeah, me being part of it has always given me that slight sort of leap in experience with foiling boats and foiling boards in this case. And I think what, what is very transferable in this case is obviously that fast decision making you have to be, you have to be committing to, you know, like things happen twice or three times as fast and you have to be thinking five steps ahead to be making it right. So sail GP, 50 knots, top speed, looks really fast, but, but actually which, which is the faster thinking game? Is it that or is it this? Difficult question, eh? I think it's a, it's a tough answer, but I think at the end of the day, all foiling classes, they, they require that fast uh, decision making, that thinking ahead. And obviously it's, it's a different case on the, on the F50s where we are six athletes on board and we have to communicate, which is giving one extra step towards that cue. No? You have to be not only doing it, but also communicating it before doing it. So it's just making it longer. And that's maybe the only thing that differentiates it. And do you think that some of the other riders here, some, some of the, 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 the top guys and girls, can see a future in some of the other foiling events like America's Cup and Sail GP? Yeah, definitely. I guess it's since, yeah, since it's so related, um, them being used to such fast speeds, it's, it's, yeah, it is something that they, they can use for their advantage in, in the future. No? Obviously, it's, it's a different class. And I think what I've seen now no, in these four years, that I've been away and now coming back with, with it being established as an Olympic class. You see how much more professional it gets, how the teams are starting to work with all that Olympic knowledge from their country that they can get and they will build up on that. And I think that's sort of the gap that they can close towards the sailing, sailing classes. And then from there on, they will be fully competitive. Flo, great to see you back here. Look forward to seeing a lot more of you and at next year's World Championship. Likewise, thank you. 
Thank you, Flo Trittle. And it also makes me think of one of the Masters riders here. We've got the Masters Worlds um, that's also been going on this week in Toro Grande, Morgan Le Gravier. Uh, and uh, he's been uh, racing in the um, Imoka. He won He won a race in the Imoka fleet uh, just two weeks ago with uh, Thomas Rouen. And he's an ex-49er sailor. And uh, Morgan loves coming back. This is the bit of sailing that that professional sailor actually spends his own time and money on. For, them, for him, this is holiday. And there's nothing he likes more than going kiteboarding, which is quite a nice advertisement for the class, isn't it? Exactly. And then we are getting more and more. Uh, we all know a lot of uh, professional sailors coming from America's Cup and other, uh, you know, than the globe, around the globe, ocean race. They are uh, practicing kiteboarding and some of them also, they start racing. That's free advertising for us. <laughs> it, it's great. All the, these different threads of the sport all coming together at the top level, all, all pulled together by the pursuit of speed with hydrofoiling. And meanwhile, we've got four riders coming into the first race of the boys' final, and they are in slow foiling mode at the moment, trying to stay on the foil. Don't really want to drop off the foil if they can possibly avoid it, but they've got to judge the time on distance. It looks the way that they're lining up like this might be four port tackers. Uh, we're looking at Cuban Huang from China with the yellow bib, Ricardo Pianosi uh, from Italy with the blue bib, Wojta Koska with the red bib and in the green bib, Gian Andrea Stragiotti with the uh, the red and black fly surfer kite, that distinctive kite. So will either of those semi-finalists be able to get close to the two that have already booked their spot in the final? There's 10 seconds to go. It seems to, we have two on port and two on starboard. Right, okay, so uh, we've got an even mm. split. Interesting to see. So, Gian Andrea Stracciotti going out to the right-hand side with Ricardo Pianosi, and it's Wojta Koska and Cuban Huang going the other way. But now one of those has tacked. Wojta Koska has tacked. The only one outside... I guess that is one. Oh, splash down on the right. Not a good tack on the right. Is that Cuban Huang that's just made a mistake on his first tack? Yeah, for sure on the left side of the screen, we have with the red kite, Stragiotti and then Pianosi. So Pianosi looks like he is in the best position at the moment. It's Pianosi going into attack. Stragiotti responds soon afterwards. Pianosi just across the front of Koska. Koska tacking to leeward of Stragiotti. And then Cuban Huang, after that terrible tack, going out to sea, giving himself a lot to do. So uh, I was surprised to see Huang starting on starboard in the first place. And it, it looks soft there. I wouldn't be surprised to see an early jibe at the top of the course. Pianosi going really fast at the moment, doing... 26 knots or so. Yes, exactly, upwind. So very high speeds at the moment, considering, especially considering how light it is in places. You have seven, eight, eight knots. <laughs> so almost four times the wind speed, in yeah. incredible. So they go past the spacer mark, around the windward mark, Pianosi with quite a healthy lead at the moment over Koska and Stragiotti fighting for second and third places. Pianosi going for fairly early jibe. We've seen some sketchy jibes by some of the girls. What would the boys be able to do? Three clean jibes there. And Cuban Huang, the yellow bib wearer, some way back, trying to play catch up. As things stand, Pianosi would draw level. He would get a match point in his favor and he would uh, put himself on match point. Um, alongside Cuban Huang. So this is a great start for the local hero, Ricardo Pianosi, on the left of your picture. And then further back in the yellow bib, playing catch up, Cuban Huang. And actually there's not a lot of ley line left. So even though it seemed yeah. like a fairly early jibe for Pianosi, it's gonna be swing your kite onto starboard jibe and get ready to 
round up almost immediately. So I wonder if there's been a wind shift. Pianozzi round in first place. Koska round in second. Stragiotti around in third. Few seconds gap. And then Cuban Huang from China bringing up the rear. Yeah, they will all tag straight. Yeah. Cuban Huang continuing out to the far side. Might as well chance his arm at something different when you're back in last place. It seems that the wind is starting to increase. You can see a little bit darker on on the west side of the course. But then they are all with the biggest sky. They are all on 23. So Stragiotti, top of your picture, then Koska, and then Pianozzi. What happened to Pianozzi there? Just Ooh. raised his kite for a moment. Uh, I went, Did he have to jump some debris in the water or something? Well, it can be, yes. It can be because he, he just... And keep up the foil, and then you try to get the air to, to clean. Right. The... Maybe it's clearing some weed off the board or something, off the foil. I don't know, but anyway, Pianozzi back in control again. He's not got much of a lead. He certainly hasn't stretched his lead. Koska breathing down his neck and Stragiotti very close behind as well. So still got a three-horse race here. I don't know how Cuban Huang has done with his upwind leg. He was going the opposite way probably because he wanted to try something, had to try something. It looks like Huang has dropped even further back, so we... We look very, very likely to be going into another race in the finals. And at the moment, it looks to be going Ricardo Pianozzi's way. And expect to see quite an early jibe, I would think. Koska mm -mm. already going for an early jibe. Pianozzi responding. Stragiotti straight into the jibe as well. Really good board control by these front three. And it looks like Koska might have a bit more wind on that side. The early jibe might be helping get him a little bit closer to Pianozzi. Yeah, you will see they will have a different angle on going deeper uh, and downwind on the, on the deeper angle. Yes, Koska will gain some space. But Pianozzi, Pianozzi will Pianozzi. still have the inside line for the next jibe. But this is going to be high-pressure stuff between Pianozzi and Koska. Two more jibe to go. This next jibe in particular. It's going to be hard for Pianozzi maybe on the inside because he's, he's got to execute a little bit more quickly than Koska. Koska's got an easier run. But Pianozzi is round. He's withstood the pressure. Koska pushing hard behind Pianozzi. One more slalom jibe mark to get round. This is going to be really important and need to be well executed and not losing space on between the mark. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's very, very close. Yeah. Koska's closed the gap a little bit more on that maneuver. Really high pressure jibe that Koska, Koska executed beautifully. But Pianozzi crosses the line, gets another match point. That's two match points on the scoreboard. Big cheers for the local Italian very well executed. Koska pushed him hard, but that now brings Ricardo Pianozzi level on points. Do you see? Oh, he was just trying to jump and have a look on his foil. Right. So there's probably a bit of seaweed there that occasionally they need to, to clean, up. clean the board. Yeah, to clean the foil. Yeah. Clean the foil. Yeah. So that, that was not a well executed start by Cuban Huang. He really... Gave himself a lot to do, starting on starboard. Right, there's there's Pianozzi and Huang on two match points. Koska and Stragiotti let, yet to put a point on the board. We'll go for a quick break. Back to you soon.
So there is Ricardo Pianozzi uh, just relaxing, and he's got a bit more time uh, before the next race because there's a, a short uh, postponement, uh, just a realignment reconfiguration of the course, and we should be up and running fairly quickly. Um, now, uh, Ricardo Pianozzi and Kibin Huang, they're, they're big guys, and also... Um, well, Gian Andrea Stragiotti, he's grown a lot in the, the last year as well. Um, rider's weight is, has been quite a big discussion point over the last couple of years. Axel Mazella, he's about 80 kilos, the French rider. Um, he doesn't really want to be any heavier than he is already, but um, it does seem like being heavier makes you go faster in these um, high apparent wind machines like the foiling kite borders. Let's hear uh, Axel Mazella's point of view. The little guys in the top 10 of this world championship. So I found this guy, Axel Mazella, 85 kilos, 185 centimeters. Um, but Axel, you're trying to get bigger as well. Just uh, quickly tell us why that is. Uh, yeah, we've seen during this year that we have to be um, bigger. We need to gain some weight to uh, pull the big sizes uh, forward, even in a strong wind. Uh, so everyone now is trying to uh, just going to 90, 95 k's. Uh, if you look at the top 10, uh, especially into the guys, we are all around uh, 90 and plus. Expect uh, some guys like uh, Ricardo or Maxime Nocher or even me or Theodore Amcourt. So um, uh, yeah, we have to. I mean, this is the way now. I don't. I don't think it. I don't know if it's a trend or what, but yeah, this is the way. So the IK have been talking about limiting kite size. I've heard some people say, no, you shouldn't do that. It should be open development. What's your view about putting a limit on maximum kite size? Um, I think it's a good idea. Um, I'm working with Ozon and uh, we think that we have to do a limitation, especially on a big size, not on the small sizes because, uh, because of the security. Um, but on the big sizes, especially when it's like Jizaya weather, when it's uh, super stable and uh, no wave and pretty easy um, condition, uh, it's most about the, um, um, the body, how can he hold a big size on the upwind and then you have a lot of power on downwind. And uh, when you're like 80 k's or you're not super tall, I mean, it's hard uh, to fight against uh, the big guys uh, and if you look at the girls it's the same problem now so uh, yeah for me I think it's good uh, idea to to stay in 21 or maybe 23 but yeah not more Axel thanks very much Tough chat. And since then, uh, since that interview I did with Axel Mazella uh, six or so months ago in Cagliari in the south of Sardinia at the World Championships, uh, there have been rule changes for the LA 2028 Olympic cycle, uh, going to limit kite sizes. So some of what he was speculating on has, has now been uh, voted on and confirmed for the next cycle beyond Paris 2024. So we've got just over a minute to go before the first race of the girls' finals. We've seen Chloe Reville and Magda Wojciechowska fight through from their sides of the semi-finals. They'll be joining the blue bib, Julia Jamasevic from Poland, and the yellow bib from France, Eloise Pigorier and Mirko, as you said earlier, this is a uh, two French against two Polish. The story of this week in the girls' division. Exactly. And uh, if it's going to be like that, we're going to have the two... Three on port and one on starboard. Yulia Damasevich seems to be the only one on starboard. It and the other three on port. It's going to be really interesting to see how the battle develops in the course between the Polish and the French. Well, let's see if any of the starboard tackers can prove me wrong. But I, I haven't seen a lot of success from starboard tack starting yet today. Not so far, yep. 14 seconds to go, 10 seconds, final approach the line. Look how far away they are from the line, but that's because they're coming in with speed. By the time they hit the line, they want to be doing 25 knots or so and really, really nicely judged starts there on yes, starboard sir. by Eloise Pigorier and Yulia Damasevich. 
Yeah, and so, Chloe Reveal and Magda, Magdalena Wojciechowska on port. Interesting that the semi-finalists, the ones that have got experience from the racing today, are the ones going out the beach side, the left of picture, as you see them now, are yellow and blue bib wearers deciding to go straight out to sea. But having said that, Mirko, it looks a little bit windier. Do you think it's a bit more consistent across the race course? Yeah, definitely, yes. Now the wind increased a little bit. We can see less patchy around, but more, uh, let's say, blue water. Uh, so for sure there is more wind all around. But it's really interesting that we saw Eloise and uh, Julia uh, start on starboard and go to the other side of the course, which so far didn't pay off yes i i just wonder if it's you the fact you've been starting on starboard all week you've got comfortable on starboard tack and making that mental switch and that foot switch to uh to starting on port i wonder if that's getting out of your comfort zone is part of the issue i don't know presumably the girls practice four rider kind of competitions in in all their training but let's see how things come back together between the two semi-finalists on one side of the course and the the two finalists the straight through to the finals from qualifying here is the moment of truth and it's going to be very very close but and, behind. But behind. <laughs> but behind. So this is good news for anyone who wants to keep this final going for a little bit longer because at the moment things are working out nicely for the two semi-finalists with Wojciechowska leading Chloe Reville and then Pogorier with a narrow lead on Yulia Damasovic. So this is a fascinating scenario that we're seeing set up here at the moment. Yeah, exactly. That's going to be really pushing, pushing, pushing from behind. <laughs> it is. Well, we've, we've seen errors. We've seen uh, boat handling errors today, so that's quite possible. Uh, but Wojciechowska and Reville were two of the more reliable ones in the semifinals. They both sailed very solidly in their semifinals, and they've got the benefit of having got extra time on the race course today. That's one of the benefits of having to go through the semi-finals. Pigorio with the yellow bib, bottom of our screen, she's gonna be the last to jibe. She's really carrying it a long way out to this side of the race course. Wojciechowska playing catch up on, um, sorry, Damasovic playing catch up on the far side. That's Damasovic on the left with Ravilla and Wojciechowska. Yeah, that's strange also the move from Eloise Pegore all the way to the right to the other side and strange strange move it is because okay you you've got an easier lay line to judge for your final approach on starboard but if you leave it too late you've got to do a 180 jibe and round up round that mark so strange that Pegore has has left it so long and then uh, we saw from the from the upwind uh, legs that the right side of the course pay off because they have, they have a little bit maybe more wind and she went uh, definitely on the other side of the course so let's see maybe we need to revise our view about Pigorier's tactics maybe that wasn't so bad after all she's she, behind anyway so she's behind but <laughs> but not as bad as i thought i i thought no i mean that that was actually nothing's changed does it nothing's really changed i thought that was quite a high risk maneuver by Pigorier, but it's not really changed anything. Oh, not really a nice stack. No, no. Yeah, it's interesting to see how desperate they are to get onto the beach side of the course. They've benefited from going that side of the course. But now she follow yeah. on the right side, straight on. Yes. And maybe Pegorio thinks that she's got pure speed that will carry her past the other riders. If she just sails the same way, goes the same direction, maybe she can rely on better speed to get her past. Maybe she she was just also trying to stay out of the other and clear air, no trouble. But Wojciechowska sailing very high uh, at the bottom of our screen. Wojciechowska in a, in a really good high mode. Tactically very strong. And Reville on the far left. So Reville going for low and fast and Magda Wojciechowska going for high and slow. And, and both can be valid ways of going up the race course. But now we'll see who's going to come out ahead out of Wojciechowska and Reville. And it's Wojciechowska by quite some margins. So the Polish rider with no race wins so far in this final, leading ahead of Chloe Reville, also 
Claude with reveal, direct wins. Claude reveal if she can round the mark with because she had an early an early tack now. Yes, yes, you're correct. So, um, so reveal if she's judged this well, may this may be an opportunity to get past Wojciechowska. It looks tight when you see it like that. You can't always rely on the tracking to give you a, an accurate sense of what's happening hmm. on the water, but uh, it reveal looks still quite comfortable. You can see Wojciechowska starting to sail a little bit of a lower line. She can, if she make it, they can't squeeze her to the mark. Ooh. She can't make it. Ooh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's going to be very expensive for Reville. Is she going to jibe round? Yeah, because anyway, she can't. Oh, no. I mean, yeah. she needs to get out of the way because yes, exactly. she's going to make a mess of it for Wojciechowska if she doesn't watch out. Yeah, the problem when, when you do such a mistake, there is no way. You're blocked. You can't tuck. You can't do anything. And Oh, dear. So now it's down to Wojciechowska to see... And Eloise. Eloise is second now. Right, so it's only Wojciechowska that stands between Heloise Pegorier and winning in the first round. So Pegorier, she obviously didn't mind what she did last time. She's doing it again. She's doing a really, really long starboard and then going for a late jibe. And Julia Damasovic also on the right-hand side. But we haven't said much about Julia so far in this race. She's really not been fighting at the front of this one so far. Magda Wojciechowska, the other Polish rider, still leading and looking like she's in good solid breeze at the moment. Got one more jibe to execute to get her down towards the bottom of the course and then it's the uh, the slalom part of the race course. So looks like she's executed that jibe. Is it a little bit too early? It's hard to tell. I think, she's, I think Magda's okay. Seems okay, yeah. But, but Magda, Magdalena, she's already on, on starboard and she would go straight to the mark. Oof. And that was that was a good rounding and, and a good attack by Pegorio. Pegorio has closed the gap. So it's not enough. Not enough, but there is still this slalom, this jibe mark to get round. Is Magda Wojciechowska going to be able to pull it off under the pressure that Pegorio is now able to exert on her? Wojciechowska... Gets that kite round back into the power zone. Looks like she's safely through. So Magda Wojciechowska from Poland about to win her first race of the final and keeps this alive for a little bit longer because Eloise Pigorier wasn't quite good enough to see that one out in one match. But still, good comeback by Pigorier, but great reaction by Wojciechowska onto one match point. Equal with Yulia Damasovic, who didn't really feature in that race. Okay, we've got less than two minutes to start the next race. A, uh, a quick uh, sum up of the scoreboard. There's Wojciechowska moving in second place on the same number of match points as Damasovic. And Chloe Reville uh, yet with none after um, misjudging that ley line. Right, a quick break and we'll be back to you with the next race in just over a minute. Mm. Okay, cost right, just yeah. over 50 seconds, and we've got. Let's just remind you, um, in the in the boys' fleet, Ricardo Pianozzi, having won the match just now, is on two match points, same as Cuban Huang. So, the big rivals across the week now go in level pegging, and uh, if either of those wins this next race, then they will become the European champion. Wojta Koska. Jan Andrea Stragiotti, the two semi finalists, they still need to get three race wins this afternoon. That seems like quite a big mountain to climb. We've got 15 seconds to go. And how many are going to go for starboard this time? I see at least one. Is it going to be a two versus two like we saw with the girls? Stragiotti and Pianosi, they are on port definitely, and uh, two on starboard. So, very similar scenario to what we saw with the girls just now. So Pianozzi and Stragiotti mm, start not clear. 
Stop. Cuban UFD OMG UFD for CHN and that is a terrible start for Cuban Huang. I mean, uh, it made a mess of the, the first race, but he's made a real mess of this one. And uh, so that really puts Ricardo Pianozzi in a very strong position. Um, and Pianozzi, well, he won't know about the UFD situation for his Chinese rival, uh, but now he's, he's in a three horse race with Wojta Koska to windward of him and Jan Andreas Stragiotti on the right of your picture to Leward. So it's up to one of the semi-finalists to try and keep this alive. So out on the far side, Huang all by himself and, and Huang disqualified. And close battle between the other three. Pianozzi, Stragiotti very, very close together. And Koska just a little bit further back. Yes, he put in the position. That's amazing. I don't see if uh, one Kibin is in front of piano or not, because it will change the for sure the mindset for the leader. Okay, so Pianozzi round in first, Koska in second. Stragiotti with the black and red kite in third, early jibe for him. And Kuin Huang, well, he's disqualified anyway, but he's back in fourth. Pianozzi looking strong at the moment on the right of your screen. Yeah, and he's keeping the wind from the left side, like we said before. Now, he doesn't need to make any single mistake and hopefully also any debris or seaweed into the foil. It's going fast and deep. R Ricardo Should Pianozzi I... doing about 28 knots of speed, pumping the board out of the jibe and Wojtykowska coming down quickly Still on port jibe. He can still put Pianozzi under pressure. So Pianozzi safely round onto the upwind leg. Koska behind him. Pianozzi going for the early tack. He likes the beach side of the race course. It has tended to be the stronger side of the course. And it's strong enough for Koska to want to follow as well. The obvious tactical move was to carry on and develop a split between himself and the leader. But uh, even Koska doesn't have enough faith in the other side of the course. But this is looking like it's going very much Ricardo Pianozzi's way. The other two, Stragiotti and Huang, are way behind. And Pianozzi, he needs to stay focused because nothing is ever certain until it's done. But this is looking increasingly like Ricardo Pianozzi is going to take the European title. Wojta Koska doing what he can to keep the battle close with the Italian. Koska going for the early attack. So if Koska has judged the ley line correctly, it's possible the Czech rider could actually catch up Ricardo Pianozzi. But if he doesn't, if he has the same problem as we saw with Chloe Reville and he has undertaken the ley line, then Ricardo Pianozzi is going to be even further ahead. Yeah, hmm. it's pretty difficult that it was on the ley line. Yeah. Oh, exactly. yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, was this, just too early. this could be game, set, and match. I, I, I don't blame Koska for going for the early tack. You've got to try something different. But if Pianozzi can get round in one, then I think Koska is going to find himself even further behind and Pianozzi is going to have a relatively easy run down to the bottom of the course. There comes the other tack from Koska. 
Pianozzi going past the spacer mark. And we don't let's see the windward mark, but there it is. And cleanly round onto Oof. the... What did you see there, Mirko? A uh, bit of this. loss of control? No, it just started pumping to get deeper angle, but it was kind of a brave move. <laughs> it doesn't need to do that. So putting some extra pressure through the foil for a bit of acceleration. So he's sailing confidently. Yeah, you have to stay calm, but in this position, I mean, you run for the third bullet and you don't have anybody behind. Uh, why pushing too much to the limit? You don't need it. Go for the result. Ricardo Pianozzi looking very stable, very solid there right now. The Italian who has struggled to get on level terms with the Chinese rider, Ki Bin Huang. And if you're watching this racing for the first time this week, this doesn't represent at all the way that Huang, the Chinese rider, has sailed this week. He, he's been absolutely unstoppable. And it, the wheels have fallen off for Huang today. And it's, it's played into the hands of Ricardo Pianozzi, who's sailed, well, he saved his best for last, hasn't he, Mirko? No, like you said, all over the week, uh, Juan Kibin didn't make any mistake at all, really consistent on the top, leading, perfect, jibe, perfect, everything. And today, during the final, two big mistake. Yeah. It sounds strange, and something happened, and this is why this sport is so fantastic. It, everything can happen in just, in a day, you can throw away the consistency of the week. Well, that's the final jive that Ricardo Pianozzi needs to execute. He's on the final few seconds. He know. He knows. <laughs> he knows. He looks relaxed, doesn't he? He looks, but I know what he's thinking about. He said he deserves it. <laughs> absolutely. And the crowd are going to go absolutely wild for this because the 18-year-old Ricardo Pianozzi on home waters becomes European and he youth didn't know. champion. He didn't know. He's no, he just worked it out now. Because he see the <laughs> yellow flag, so you have to figure out now. All right, well, let's see if the celebrations the really kick off. The coach need to tell them. Right. So we're excited for you, Ricardo. <laughs> and who is that in the water? Is, it, I think is that it's VJ? A it's a, a small mader. VJ mader. <laughs> it's... Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, the younger brother of, of two of the big names on the circuit, um, Max Mader and Carl Mader. And um, it's Max Mader um, who's beaten Ricardo Pianozzi so many times in the past, the Singaporean rider. It looked like another Asian Cuban Wang was going to take the, uh, the European Championship away from the Italian today, but it didn't work out that way because Wang just hasn't sailed his best today. And instead, it was Riccardo Pianozzi from Italy sailing on home waters in Torre Grande, Sardinia, that becomes Formula Kite Youth European Champion 2023. So congratulations to Riccardo Pianozzi. Yes, it was an amazing race. Well done. A very quick break, and we'll be back to you shortly. The final right, two. so no time to draw breath, no time to celebrate any more uh, what's just happened in the boys because we've got the, uh, the the girls, we've got the next race coming up in 40 seconds and I know that our drones are taking off because the seagulls are, are barking at the, <laughs> at the drones so it must be game time, not just for us but for the Sardinian seagulls. 30 seconds to go. Now, is there any more evidence required to show people that starboard tack is actually the high risk way to start in a four rider final. How many will we get start starting on port? It looks like we've got all four with 15 seconds to go about to start on port. All, all, all of four on port. So this is Eloise Pigorier in the yellow, Julia Damasovic in blue, Chloe Reveal and Magda Wojciechowska all launching off the line. Clear start. Okay, so all of them in the race. And 
good start for the Polish riders further to windward. Magda Wojciechowska and Yulia Tomasevic. Chloe Reville also with a good start. Actually, the, the weakest start is pop, probably Eloise Pogorier, the, the yellow bib wearer. Now, Pogorier is still on match point. She only needs to win this race and she would go through. Um, we've seen Magda Wojciechowska win the earlier race. So she and the other Polish rider, Julia Domasevich, are on one race win and they need to win two more to go through. And Chloe Reville needs to win three. So Wojciechowska looking strong at the bottom of the picture. Then Yulia Damasevich is next up, then Chloe Reville, and then further up on the far side, Eloise Pigorier. Now, it looks like a really big wind shift. It, it looks like a big header has hit them. So I don't think the two Polish riders are going to make the ley line. Um, but the benefit to them is that possibly none of them will make the ley line unless Pigorier has put enough in the bank to be able to get round. We saw this uh, with Catalina Turienzo earlier on in semi-final A. We saw the Argentinian seemingly overstand the ley line, but actually judging it beautifully. But if we're to believe the position of Mark 1 on our tracking, then this shift has been so big that everybody else is going to have to tack. And it makes me think, actually, if somebody had started on starboard and gone out to sea, maybe they would be leading by a country mile. Exactly. Um, <laughs> But uh, everyone has had to tack. So this makes things a little bit interesting, doesn't it? We've got big wind shifts going on out there. That, and this is poor sailing, Andy. Poor sailing, yes. <laughs> they just didn't see that 40-degree wind shift coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe 30, but yeah. <laughs> and it looks like it's heading back the other way again. So, so where the wind actually started out is where it looks like it might be returning to. We've got four simultaneous tacks all at the same time. This is going to be very... T oh, two crashed down behind. We've only got two in this race right now. And that is Chloe Reville and Yulia Damasovic because Wojciechowska and Eloise Pecorier fluffed their tacks. They fluffed their lines. And so going around in first place, marginally in front, is Yulia Damasovic just ahead of Chloe Reville. And look, it just... Oh, I wonder if it was the pressure of tacking at the same time and they, they, was it a lack of breeze or was it the fact that they were both tacking in the same place wanting to do the same thing at the same time? What do you think, Mika? Yeah, the second that you said, they were just really too close and the leeward kite just got a bad wind from the, uh, the windward kite and then they stopped foiling and the kite just touched a little bit and you stop it. I mean, you don't have power. So that was a, it's a big, mistake. Yeah, yeah, big mistake, understandable mistake when things were so tight at the top of the race course. And none of that would have happened without those big wind shifts and, and suddenly putting the fleet on level terms. So Reveal and Julia Damasovic on the right of your picture. Really, really close battle for first place. Magda Wojciechowska, she was the first to pick herself up, dust herself down and get up and running again. So Wojciechowska possibly in the running. It's it's to her benefit that the two leaders are so close with Reville and Damasovic doing simultaneous jibes and, and this will put each of them under pressure. Good jibe by Reville on the left, chasing down Damasovic. And neither of these riders are going to be able to win this world, uh, this European Championship um, on this uh, on this race. The only one that could have done that is Heloise Bigurier, and it's Bigurier, the French rider in the yellow bib, who is furthest behind. So it, it looks very likely that we're going to see this taken to another race beyond this one. Chloe Reville was the first to tack. Yulia Damasovic responds also by tacking, and they both have to pump the board to get it up and running again, while Magda Wojciechowska carries on further out to sea, and Pigorier is still to round the bottom mark. Whose position do you like out of Damasovic and Reveal? No, Yulia is, uh, is really trying to control uh, Reveal. Reveal, I think she's the only one without any bullet, right? 
Yes, that's exactly. correct. So if he's gonna win, reveal, then open for one more bullet, this, the final for the girl. And if Magda, she will score the bullet, then at least it's gonna be two and two. So it's interesting that Demasovic was the first attack. She she broke off from putting a cover on Reveal. And so if Demasovic has judged her ley line correctly, then she's going to put herself a long way ahead. Someone is down in the water. I'm not quite sure who that is. So someone is struggling to keep their kite in the sky. And it looks like it might be Reveal. I think Reveal... It might be Reveal. ...has fluffed yeah. her attack. I wonder if she ran out of wind. So look how far back Glory Reveal is there. You can just about see her kite just below the line of the sandy beach. And Yulia Damasovic looking very comfortable now as she comes towards the top of the course for the final time in this second race of the girls' finals. Magda Wojciechowska won the race earlier in the afternoon, and now it looks like it's going to be another Polish rider, Yulia Damasovic, that wins the next one. Absolute night and day between Yulia Damasovic and the rest of the fleet right now. But nothing is ever for certain. As you said earlier, Mirko, yeah. you can't take anything for granted. No. No, absolutely. And then you can see now, Julia, she just need to continue running and try to close the, the deal and get the second bullet. It's the only thing that she can do now without any mistake at all. And, and, meanwhile, and look for the next final. <laughs> it's going to be a next another final for it's, sure. It's going to have to be, isn't it? Yeah. You would think so. But it, it's really close still between Chloe Reville and Magdalena Wojciechowska, second and third. Simultaneous jibes. We've seen simultaneous jibes go wrong before now. But uh, they managed to execute. But this is only going to make life easier for Julia Damasovic because these two were stuck in a match race that really doesn't matter in the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that race wins are the only thing that counts in this medal series format. And Julia Damasovic is all, already almost down at the bottom of the race course. But I can tell you again, it was quite a tactics uh, race, this one, because we had the wind, wind shift between 20 to 30 degree back and forth, back and forth on the right to the left, and which looks really, really good as a sailor. And they've been really Perfect. And Julia Damasovic, she will have gone round the bottom of the course, but this is where the battle is. It's an interesting one between Chloe Reville and Magda Wojciechowska, but both of them will also be thinking, we really need Julia to fluff her lines at the bottom of this race course. Damasovic only has the jibe mark to go around, and that's her executing that. And now another 100 metres across the finish line, and Damasovic will put a win on the board, and that will take her to match point alongside Heloise Pegorier, who's bringing up the back of the fleet after a disastrous first leg when she had that splashdown. So congratulations to Julia Damasovic from Poland, now on two match points, only needs one more to see out the European Championship. Yeah, really good comeback from her. We saw in the previous, in the previous final was always behind, but now she got the confidence. Right, a quick, a quick break and we'll be back to you soon.
So the girls' European title is perfectly poised now with the yellow bib wearer and the blue bib wearer. One from France, one from Poland, uh, each on match point. They only need to win the next race and either Eloise Pogure or Julia Damasovic would become the youth European champion. But of course, we're seeing good sailing from the others, from Chloe Reville and Magda Wojciechowska, another French and Polish rider. And Mirko, I, at the beginning of the week, the French were tending to dominate and the Polish have got stronger as the wind has got a little bit stronger later on in the week. And uh, the, the French seemed a little bit more comfortable in the light, the Polish a little bit more comfortable in the strong. But that isn't really, that trend's not really bearing out today, is it? No, exactly. And then also the wind shift and the tactical difference between uh, the race course from the right to the left to help the, the Polish come out and get better over the French. So it's going to be really interesting the next final because now we have one Polish and one French on two bullet. Well, this is another Olympic class. Uh, tactics and strategy, we did just played a, a big, important part of the race that we saw just then. This isn't just about all, all going all out. So we're going to do a, a video with uh, Joe Glanfield shortly, but just let's update ourselves on the, the scores. Julia Damasovic um, now draws level with Eloise Pogorier both on match point. Magda Wojciechowska winning the first race earlier this afternoon on one point. Chloe Reville sailing really well, but nothing to show for it with points yet. So that's the scenario. We're still on a slight delay. So Joe Glanfield, double Olympic silver medalists, overview of one of the most successful, if not the most successful Olympic team of all time. Uh, that's Great Britain. Let's see what Joe Gl Glanfield makes of this new world of kite in the Olympics. Glanfield, and uh, I'm the head coach of the British sailing team. So, so essentially, I work across all ten classes uh, that compete at the Olympics. Uh, I've got a long background in the Olympics. Um, so, I competed at three Olympics myself uh, in the 470 class um, uh, and got two medals. And, and then I, I've coached the last three Olympics, uh, coaching uh, Hannah Mills uh, with Sastia. Clark and Ailey McIntyre at, at the last Olympics. Um, so, so I guess uh, my ex my background is very much dinghies, um, uh, always has been, um, and my understanding of uh, kiting is quite limited. Um, but I guess what I would bring to this environment potentially is more of an understanding of uh, the Olympics itself and how to build up to the Olympics. Um, so, so I guess my, my purpose for being here really is to get a better understanding of the kite class. Where, where are the parallels? Where are the similarities between uh, other classes that have already been at the Olympics for a number of cycles? And, and what's different? What's new? And will we have to approach in a new way? Well, I think I, I'm still learning where, where kiting is at now. Um, I think what we've probably seen in other Olympic classes uh, that have come in uh, have come in in the past is is people get more professional people will increase the number of hours they're doing um, and people will add more process to how to get better you know you would expect that the the winners of this Olympics will be at a higher standard than they are now um, so really it's a development game you know and 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 them figuring out how how do I methodically improve. I, I, I'm not greatly placed to sit to know that, but I, I think um, I don't think it's inevitable. I think what you prob what probably is inevitable is that the racing gets closer. So so then in, in, inevitably there's more interaction between boards or boats in another class, and and that will need to be worked through. Where, whereas before there was probably bigger speed differences and so more space on the course. As that, as that fleet improves, it gets more congested. So people then need to uh, be more aware of what's around them and understand those limits better. And then, and then maybe, as the class evolves, also the rules need to evolve a bit or the application of the rules. Um, but I'm, I'm not, in a way, I don't have a great view of that and, um, and what that is in the kites. Fighting, uh 
That was Joe Glanfield. This is Ricardo Pianozzi. Hi to everyone. The new European youth champion, Ricardo. Fantastic. Thank you. You sailed so well today. Yeah, thank you. What were your feelings going into today? Because Kumin Huang has sailed so well this week. Yeah. What, how did you rate your chances of being able to win the gold today? I don't really know. This morning I go in the water and I have a really good uh, feeling. And that's it. I, when I go in the water, I was thinking, yeah, that's my condition. That's, that's regatta. It's possible. Now... You decided to start on Port Tack, and we saw Cuban Huang deciding to start on starboard. What were you thinking at the time? Were you thinking that might make life easier? Were you a little bit surprised that he was going for the starboard? Yeah, I'm surprised. When I saw Cuban go on the on the left side of the of the course, uh, I'm not really sure about his uh, what is his plan, but. I saw a really big, uh, a really good uh, part in the right side, and so I applied this tactic in this regatta. But that's it. I just watch the course and I choose uh, which part to go. And uh, for me, the best part is the right, and it was correct. Well, you made it look very easy today, but we know that it wasn't easy. And the battle that you've had uh, with Cuban, we saw summed up yesterday with that tangle of kites yeah. and. That, that simultaneous jibe, that, that was so tight, so close. What, what were your thoughts at the time when you had that clash? Sometimes it happens, we are really close. For me, it's not my fault. I didn't protest because it doesn't change nothing. I, I have too much, uh, you have too much uh, first and doesn't change really nothing. Um, the other thing is, You've done. You've just won a youth European title, but you'll focus on the big prize yep. next year, going for Italy, representing Italy, Paris 2024, the yeah. Olympic Games. Um, how do you feel aiming at the senior competition, the Olympic Games? I'm feeling good now. I changing my stuff. I testing. I'm choose everything for for. I I, I tested everything for. A, Total perfect for the for the world this uh, year, and the next uh, goal is this for this for yeah. my, for me. And I don't know if you're you probably have to kill me if you told me, but what what are your Olympic trials? When when does that start? When does it finish? When is it finish? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. And that's that's pretty tough, isn't it? I mean, Cuban for China, he's probably very likely to go for China. He's the standout best. Uh, you've got some other strong Italians that you've yeah. got to get past as well. So yeah, I have a really good battle with Lorenzo for go to the Olympic. It's not really, it's not easy because it's, it was very fast and it is very fast and I don't know who's going. This is a fast developing sport. You look back to a year ago. What are you doing better now than you were a year ago? And what will you need to be doing better a year from now, just before the Olympics? Training, training, and training. Just this. For one, for win, you need to training a lot. Uh, stay focused with your mind and give everything. And you were focused today. We've seen a lot of errors on the race course. People crashing down. Yeah. Um, for not able to keep their kite in the air or their yeah. board above the water. You look solid today. Yeah, yeah. Did you keep a calm mind today? It's not easy today because it's full of seaweed and in the first race I have a problem and it do jump for leaving the, the seaweed. It's, it's not easy. And Kibin, I think, crashed for the seaweed in the first race. Ricardo, you're on home water. A lot of support for you here in Italy. How are you going to be celebrating this evening? I don't know because I'm really late for the flight. I have the flight tomorrow morning really early for go to Holland because I have the Alliance Regatta. And so I don't know. I think I'm going to Cagliari and I celebrate it here. Okay. With my, maybe with my girlfriend we go out for dinner. Right. I mean, well, I hope you manage to fit in that dinner before you, you go off to the Netherlands. Wish you the best of luck back in the senior competition. At a, at a World Cup event, yeah. but for today, absolutely fantastically so. Well Thank done. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, that was Ricardo. Uh, we were still on a short delay, so uh, quick break, and we'll be back to you to update you with things.
Thank you, Ricardo Pianosi, and congratulations to him again. Just uh, another evening at home in Italy and then flies out straight to compete in the next event, uh, senior Olympic level competition, a World Cup taking place in Almere in the Netherlands. Uh, so the conditions have gone a bit squirrely. Mirka, what, what do you make of it? How, what, what's it looking like out there? Yeah, we were looking uh, over the last 10, 15 minutes, the wind is shifting between 260 to 300, 310 sometime. And uh, we see this uh, just keeping moving mark and it's not stable. So let's see what's going to what is going to happen over the last few few minutes from the right side now we can see some darker part hopefully it's going to be more steady and allow the next final of the girl uh, starting so. yeah so anxious moments and uh, difficult to to know what to do as an athlete How, wh where to keep your head do you stay in adrenaline mode or do you calm down a little bit and save yourself for when uh, when you need to bring the energy back in again it's quite difficult yeah the only things that they can do is just stay in the water and keep an eye all over the horizon and the the wind will mark just to see how the wind it develop that is really important for their mind to know when they start where to go it's really important well, Mirko, you know all about the strength of Italian competition on board sports. You've been a lifelong windsurfer, and now you're heavily promoting this sport and also wing foiling. And Alessandra Sensini, she's an icon of Italian Olympic sailing, one of the all-time greats. Uh, I did an interview with her earlier this week in Torre Grande. With four Olympic medals in her glittering career, Alessandra Sensini is one of the all-time greats in Olympic sailing, achieving those four medals in windsurfing. Alessandra, we're seeing even more board sports in Olympic sailing now. What's your role with the Italian Federation? I am the director of the youth sailing department and um, that's why I'm here with the kids uh, to help them uh, in these important competitions. We start uh, with the kiteboarding, uh, with the 20 racing uh, in 2018 uh, when, with the Youth Olympic Games in, in Buenos Aires. And then they switch to foiling, to kite foiling. Now kite is uh, at the Olympics, uh, Paris. Uh, 2024 so that's uh, a great uh, opportunity for all these kids to go to the Olympics in this beautiful uh, discipline. Um, and we see that some of these kids are actually sailing Olympic standard. It's quite possible that we'll see teenagers win Olympic medals in Paris 2024. So does that require a, a different kind of coaching when athletes are so young? I think that the foiling uh, uh, put down the age uh, of the athletes and I think this is great uh, and um, yeah I think uh, I'm sure that we will see in Paris uh, uh, athletes that will have the medal that they are really young and uh, they have uh, better skills uh, on this discipline and uh, uh, they are really strong and I think it's a good uh, thing for the for the sports when uh, youth have opportunity to beat the older. <laughs> so you competed at six Olympic Games. You won four Olympic medals. So in those other two, presumably you were disappointed not to win medals. But but what do you learn on on the journey of competing on a campaign with the, the highs and the lows? Well, you learn a lot from when you lose, of course, because it's there that you learn <laughs> really what to do. And uh, but in a way, in, in some way, it's even easier because when you lose, you have other people to watch to, and uh, you um, you have a, a better idea what uh, to do. It's when you are on the top, when you win, that you have to invent yourself, and this is not uh, so so easy so and um, but um uh, what i say it's a, a competition it's always a challenge and uh, what you learn is uh, uh, to challenge yourself every day every day you go in the water you have something that you have a goal and you want to get it and uh, it, it, 
yeah, you, you, your life is dedicated to that sport and uh, to that dream that you have that is the Olympic. Even though you're in a solo competition, a, a solo windsurfer, a solo kiteboarder, you need to have a good team around you? Uh, yeah, but um, you have to be, you have to think that uh, um, you um, need to succeed with what you have. You know, first of all, you had to look at what you have at the moment and uh, and say, okay, I have this, I want to reach this uh, uh, goal, this uh, result. And um, and then you, you have to do it with what you have. You have to uh, get uh, the, the best or the, I mean, the the most, not the best, the most of what you have and not think too much about what, what will be the best team or organization or program to, you know, to succeed. You need to start from what yeah, you have at the moment. And then after uh, you reach something and then you start to build again. Okay, so uh, that process of, of working with what you have but always looking for the next step. Alessandra, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Well, Mirko, you must know Alessandra from a long way back. Both of you windsurfers. Uh, what made Alessandra as great as she was with her career? Yeah, we know each other since when we were really young from the youth Italian championship, I must say maybe 80s, whatever, maybe middle 80s, so quite a long time ago. And she's been impressed uh, from the real beginning. She was so committed to do well and, and to win. And she just succeeded as it was when she was young. So it just put a lot of head and and all, you know, the, you know, 100% of her power to, to succeed on what she did. Really great person. A great person to have behind the Italian Federation pushing forwards athletes like Riccardo Pianozzi, our, our new youth European champion. So uh, we are getting back into sequence fairly soon for the next girls final race. So that's good news. We've got just under eight minutes. Um, so what else is on the agenda this year? This is a super busy year. It's the, the last year before Paris 2024. And the biggest one of all is the World Championships for all the Olympic classes in The Hague, the Netherlands. Sailing World Championship here in beautiful The Hague. Bring the action. See you there. This is predominantly flat water, uh, very little current, as far as I'm aware, Mirko. The, the Hague is gonna be potentially big waves, well, certainly strong current, that much is guaranteed. Two and a half knots of, of current at times. It's, uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be really a big challenge for everyone, I guess, from the athletes, from the coach point of view, and all the rest management part in, uh, uh, in The Hague. <laughs> and what about your role, will you be there? I will be there somehow. Oh yes, <laughs> tell me. And what in what uh, position? I will manage the the race course. <laughs> you're, you're very shy about this. Okay, yeah, so thank you. You are going to be the race officer. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, right. I'm really looking forward to make us better as we can. And it's it's going to be. You're going to need to look at those tide tables. See if the tide's taking the fleet upwind or downwind, and. And if it's wind against tide, the waves can be absolutely enormous there, can't they? Yeah, I mean, I remember The Hague uh, from well, when I was windsurfer 25, 30 years ago, and there was always been 
tough condition, never easy on that sea, never, for whatever reason. So I'm really looking forward to see what it will be our challenge this year, because for sure it's gonna, it's gonna happen something. It's not gonna be easier. Uh, but again, the best will always win. That's true. That's very true. Um, so that will be a fascinating one to see play out. I'll be reporting across all 10 events, but I hope to get a chance to come and say hello to you. But it's an absolutely enormous event. So it's, it's one of those weeks where we might not even see each other. It's just, yes, the Hague's yes. going to be a busy place. Yeah, all Olympic classes and thousands of people involved and a lot of race course yeah we might have the chance not to meet each other unless we <laughs> chat together and we organize <laughs> well we can we can yeah. share notes when we meet up later on in the year back in calorie for for some of the events later on in the year in sardinia yeah um, in october <laughs> in october seems like a long way away but it will it will whiz around from then so time to the start four minutes 30 and it seems the wind went all the way to the right side, uh, close to the direction of yesterday. So it's getting close to Mistral now, which was not expected and forecasted anywhere. So pretty curious. Yeah. So, is that going to suggest that we we go for a, a different kind of starting tactic? Is is that going to make starboard any more interesting? No, because also yesterday with the Mistral wind, they went just a little bit on starboard and then uh, the, the, the top guys, they went on attack on the right side of the course anyway. So it might, this, is, this is, might be the choice for four only start on port and all the way try to hit the lane line on the right side of the course. But... Well, meanwhile, unfortunately, the uh, the red and white AP flag is flying, so we're on to another postponement. So that's our race officer, Michal Jolovski from Poland, who's making the decisions. And we just saw Eloise Pegorier with the yellow bib just riding out off the back of the committee boat. It's a high-stress job, I would imagine, Mirko. Um, I mean, I've never done it, but this is part of what you do. It's what you're doing at the World Championships. Yeah, the job that Mikael is doing is just amazing. And then being sitting on the race committee is not only sitting. You have to have uh, 10 eyes open and calculate everything and have always a plan B, C, D in your, uh, in your pocket and uh, make the right decision. You know, it's a really big pressure. Yeah. And it, he's a, a dedicated follower of fashion. I don't know if that's Prada, Versace or Gucci that he's wearing on his legs. Well, have you got anything similar for when you're race officer? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm different. This is why, Mikael, it looks so different from anybody else. And he, this is his fashion. And this is Mikael. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not afraid to put it out there, is he? No, no, he's so cool. So look, they are in the waiting it, game. It seems it seems that it's going better now. Uh, everyone is going back and forth, just close to the race committee. Well, while we're still waiting, maybe we got time to play an interview that I did with Morgan Le Gravier. Um, I sports. I mentioned Morgan earlier in the week. Um, let's see if we can get that Morgan Le Gravier video. Morgan Le Gravier, uh, nice to see you here at the Masters Worlds. Now, I know your name from other things in sailing, like Olympic 49er racing, and then more recently in mocha racing, including comp uh, competing in the Vendée Globe. So how do you have such a diverse career in this sport? So I like to, to practice many, many sailing kind of, of, of boat uh, because I think it's a good way to, to improve improve in, uh, in all the class it's, uh, it's always a, a, a sail, a boat or a kite or a foil and uh, it's really interesting for me to, to touch every, every kind of, uh, of support. You're so, more for diversification you believe that the, the sailor is made stronger 
by sailing in a 60 foot Amoka or a, a 49er or a, a three foot. I, I'm Voila. not sure, but it's depend of uh, of people. But uh, for me, I'm sure that it's the best way to improve because it's the best way to take pleasure, and uh, life is take pleasure. So pleasure. So, so if you are always in pleasure, you you improve a lot, you learn a lot, and uh, for me, it's, it's the best way to 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 do to do your maximum. So. We've seen the effect of hydrofoiling come into all forms of the sport in the last ten years: the America's Cup, LGP, and now even the Amokas of foiling and, and you won a race the most most recently just a couple of weeks ago with Thomas Rouen in the Amoka. What relevance, what crossover is there between a foiling 60 foot Amoka and the kind of kite foiler that you're racing <laughs> here in Toro Grande? It's, it's a hard question for my poor English, but uh, it's, it's always, um, you know, wind, uh, sail, foil and, and boat. So you can... Uh, you can you can cross many things between all the this support so you can uh, in all this this support you have speed because when you fall you you are really fast you have like a win uh, apparent win close to you know to to, to all this, uh, this this supports too and uh, i don't know because sailing is it's um, when when you sail you 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 feel a lot of uh, sensation feel a lot of things you, you can't talk about it because it's like it's just like feeling and uh, when when you when you kite you you feel a lot of things you have no electronic no all your your performance and your and your sensation are, are, are you so you are you and you feeling so i don't know i don't i don't have the world to, to the world to explain it but uh, i feel it in my heart and uh, but, uh, so D does the kite boarding, the kite foiling that you do here, does that make you a better Imoka sailor in any way? I'm not sure, but uh, at this time, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really g not good, but I'm, I'm, uh, I don't have the word. Uh, uh, I, I feel good in the Imokas, and I'm, I'm, I did some good things just a few weeks ago. So I think it's my preparation and my way of life. It's a it's a good way to to to, to be good in uh, Imokas and uh, to be to be better than the other. So I don't know I don't know s someone uh, in Imokas kites who who did kite phoning before. So I think maybe it's a good you're preparation. The, <laughs> maybe you're the first. And they're so different as well, aren't they? Because um, every, there's so many electronics, um, so many sensors, hydraulics. The boat is even steered by autopilot. Here, it's all about you and your connection with the board through your feet. In some ways, it couldn't be more different. Sure, sure. Your question are really interesting. If if the Imokas boats are really complicated, uh, there is still a human part. There is still feeling uh, because uh, if you are the, the if you have the best autopilot, if you are the best. Uh, uh, technical on board, you 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 still understand him. You still uh, um, have to to you know to, to program it. So the the, the start point is always uh, the feeling of the of the skippers. It's still important to to start with your feeling and uh, and to keep uh, an eye on the feeling on the, on water with dinghy class and with kite class too. Morgan, thank you so much. Thank you. So, and sorry again for my English. No, no problem. <laughs> uh, so, does any other questions? Uh, I'll do some uh, separate standing. And Thank you, Morgan Le Gravier. And well, the Amokas have been in the news over the last couple of days, uh, setting new all out monohull 24 hour distance records up to something like 640 nautical miles in 24 hour period for Team Militia. So, uh, yeah, the Amokas are showing what can be done with putting hydrofoils on the bottom of a 60-foot uh, monohull. Well, we're back to looking at what hydrofoils can do in the final of the, uh, the girls' European Youth Championship. And just to remind you, we've got two riders on match point. They only need to win one more race. That's Heloise Begorier in the yellow bib, Yulia Demasevich in the blue bib, the French and the Polish riders, and two other uh, French and Polish riders, uh, Magda Wojciechowska and Chloe Reville, 
also in contention. 42 seconds to go. Uh, I can feel the breeze in the tent, Miyako, uh, but is it stable enough for a good race? Yes, now the wind went straight to Mistral, so I'm pretty confident that we can run the race. It's going to be a fair race for the four finalists. And all of them on port, like we said before, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to go on the left side of the course just to avoid one extra attack. Just go straight to the right side of the course. The wind is Mistral, so it's patch, but on the right side is more flat and Five and easy seconds. to go faster. Three, two, one. Very close to the start for, for one of those riders. Let's see if it's a clear Only start. Only one just it race was start early. not clear. Eloise. Eloise UFD. So our yellow bib wearer, UFD. So this puts a cat among the pigeons. That means that the only rider that can win the championship in this race is Julia Damasovic, also on two match points. So what a disaster for Eloise Pegorier. And this feels a little bit like what happened to Cuban Huang. I mean, also getting a UFD, wearing the yellow beard, being dominant all week. Um, Pegori hasn't been so dominant the last couple of days. It's been going more in the direction of Damasovic. But Damasovic had a slow start to the day, did win that last race, and seems to be coming good now. So how, yeah, are, they, how are they looking? Oh. It was a strange move because uh, they went uh, all four on port. And then uh, Magda Wojciechowska, she noticed that she were earlier and then she tacked on, on starboard. And this is why we saw only one, but really not full speed crossing on starboard. And maybe Eloise Pegoret just decided, OK, it might not be too early, but she just... I wonder if she has any doubts in her mind as she leads towards the top of the course. Does she have it in the back of her mind that that was a little bit too close for comfort? It's hard to know, isn't it? It's hard to know because now you're leading and unfortunately it doesn't count. So Pigore about to lead around the women mark, followed by Magda Wojciechowska and then Chloe Reville just ahead of Yulia Damasovic, neck and neck really. So, going past the spacer mark, now around the yellow windward mark, the yellow bib, who has been UFT disqualified, not yet aware of that fact. Leading, followed by Magda Wojciechowska, who won a race earlier in the afternoon, and then neck and neck for third and fourth place between Chloe Reville and Julia Damasovic. Yeah, how can you make such a mistake being UFD on in four? Well, because you I mean, are... You have to push, you have to push. But, I mean, it's really important to try not to be UFD over a final when you have two match points together with another. I mean, it's... I, suppose, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose. But, I mean, I, I think the time on distance judgment when you're going this fast must be pretty difficult. That's Chloe Reville at the bottom of the screen, just completing a jibe. And then in the far distance, going down towards the yellow mark, top right of our screen, it's Eloise Begorier, the soon-to-be disqualified rider from this particular match. So if it goes to Magdalena Wojciechowska, next bullet, then... We're going to have three. Hang on a moment. Not that it really matters, but Pegorier's had a terrible rounding. So Pegorier's managed to get up and running again, and she's got such a big lead. Sorry about that. Mirko, you were saying about Magda Wojciechowska. If she's going to score a bullet, then we next race is going to be three of them. It's going to be a great scenario. Two, on two bullet. Exactly. So... So the neutrals amongst us that want to see a bit more racing this afternoon, that that would be an amazing scenario if Magda Wojciechowska were to be able to win a race and then we'd have a three-way fight. Magda Wojciechowska leading the charge out to the right and effectively winning this race as Eloise Begorier goes out to the far side, but we can disregard her performance in this race anyway. Wojciechowska attacking 
And now on Port Tack. Chloe Reville and Yulia Damasovic going further out towards uh, out to sea, so trying to create more of a split from Magda Wojciechowska. Now, Heloise Bakurie, if she win, if she crosses the finish line in first, what kind of reaction are we going to see from her? Is she going to celebrate, thinking that she's won? I mean, she will see a yellow flag on the finish, so something happened, then maybe they realize that something happened. Right. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a horrible thought, isn't it? To think that somebody might cross the line thinking they've won the championship and only to discover that it's slipped away from them. But if it's Magda Wojciechowska that wins this race, then that's good news for Pigorier because it keeps her hopes alive still. Yeah, but Julia now she's third and uh, not far away from uh, from Magda. No, that extra distance that they sailed out towards the left side of the course seems to have closed the gap on Magda Wojciechowska. Yeah, we can say you know it's like a five six second. It's enough to just have a quick splash into the water and then you're done. So. It looks like lovely conditions, doesn't it? So the, this Mistral that you're talking about, Mika, what is the Mistral? Uh, the Mistral is the wind typical uh, coming from all the way through from south of France, eating Sardinia, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean. And this is here we are on the west coast. And uh, it's the first part of Sardinia that is eaten by the Mistral wind, the typical northwest wind. Well, it seems to be coming good this afternoon and the Masters will be getting ready for finishing their World Championship this afternoon as well. So more racing to happen. But this is what we're focused on, the outcome of the Formula Kite Youth European Championship. We have our winner in the boys division with Riccardo Pianozzi from Italy. And now we see how things play out with the girls. And at the moment... It's Heloise Begorie going round in the lead, but she's been UFD disqualified. Magda Wojciechowska still leading the rest. So this is potentially a race win for Wojciechowska that will take her level with Pegorie and Damasovic, who will all then be on two match points. Yeah, I think it's the only hope of Heloise Begorie now. Hopefully that Magda Wojciechowska... He's going to win. We can't see now because we have the finish line a little bit farther out from before. And that's Wojciechowska crossing the line, taking the race win ahead of uh, Yulia Damasovic and Chloe Reville, bringing up the rear. There's that yellow flag that you referred to, Mirko. So what does the yellow flag mean? that there is some uh, information for the rider uh, protested. So they have to go close and for sure it's not a clear race when there is a yellow flag on it. So, so interesting scenario set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's two wins apiece now for Magda Wojciechowska, who joins Yulia Damasovic and Eloise Begorie as a uh, as being on match point and there you see Wojciechowska at the top of the standings ahead of Damasovic Poland Poland France France Chloe Reville still with a lot to do needs to get three race wins and she's showed the ability today to be able to do that just hasn't quite been able to to put those scores on the board but this is a very evenly matched four rider final that we're looking at here yeah next one is going to be really interesting Okay, next start in just over four minutes. Back to you shortly.
ER5. Built to win. So with three minutes 30 to the start, and this Mistral win seems to be getting stronger. It seems to be picking up. And of course, riders always want to change kite, side, uh, kite size when Breeze is changing. Are we getting anywhere close to people wanting to switch to a different kite? I don't think so. We're still uh, below 10 knots, so they're going to keep their biggest size. The girl they are using between 19 and 21, uh, they will not change. Absolutely yeah. not. And with the flat water, they can handle Okay, um, and as the wind gets stronger, do, do you think there's anyone in particular that might benefit from that? Mm. Now we have three of them on two bullets. Uh, for sure, all of them, they know it needs to be a push now. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. So let's see if Julia, Magdalena or Eloise, let's see, they're going to they're gonna for sure follow each other and uh, maybe don't leave Chloe Reville alone and then she will score a bullet. Well, let's see, let's see, I'm curious. Less than, t I mean, a little bit more than two minutes to the start. Eloise Pigorier, if she hadn't have been over the line, she probably still would have won that race. Yeah. You know, that's a very if and but statement to make but she she won that race fairly comfortably and of course when you start a little bit earlier than everyone else that always gives you a big advantage but she seemed like she was pretty fast in in that breeze just then just under two minutes to go and there is the dreaded u flag the red and white flag that says you must not be over the start line within the last 60 seconds before the start gun fires So, two French, two Polish. Who's going to be joining Ricardo Pianozzi in the celebrations this evening? He's already won the boys' contest ahead of his arch rival from China, Kibin Huang, who was wearing the yellow bib for the first time in his career, actually, and, and looked like he well deserved it all the way through the week until the final day when it, he just wasn't able to find his best form. And this is beautifully balanced now between these three riders, all on match point. And that's Magda Wojciechowska, winner of the race just now. Yulia Domasevic and Eloise Bigorier. 45 seconds to go. And I'd be really surprised if we see anything other than four riders starting on port tack. Yeah, scenario almost like before unless that someone was too early and they just tack at the last few seconds. Hopefully they're going to make the right decision not to cross the starting line too early. 20, 20 seconds now. 15 seconds, moment of truth. The last, I mean, they are a little bit over early. Did you see they have to keep foiling in low mode? So they are just a little bit too early. In five seconds, you do a lot of... Yes, you can see that. There's the swinging the kite down. Oof. Oh, and Did we you got... see two, they were too early. They got close to the race committee, but they just stuck on starboard. So we got an even split, and that, that those were two very good starts by the starboard attackers. And as Mirko was explaining, it was uh, a little bit too close for comfort for the port tackers. So on starboard, we've got the two poles, Yulia Damasevich and Magdalena Wojciechowska going out to sea. And on the right, we've got the two French, Chloe Reville and Eloise Pigorier. And Pigorier going into quite a, um, a heading shift. It really seems to be shifting turning down for her. So I, I think you might see earlier than usual tax from the French riders. I wonder if this means that yeah. the French have found themselves not only on the right side of the course, but on the correct side of the course. Yeah, now uh, the wind shift play in advance with uh, the two Polish because the wind went a little bit to the left. So we can see the angle from Magda and uh, Julia better to the wind war mark. So this is going to be interesting to see how the conversion between Poland on the left and 
France on the right works out towards the top of the race course. And Mirko, what do you think? How's it looking? Yeah, it's looking, looking different from before. So they were really, it was a good call for the two Polish to go a little bit farther on the, on the left side, on starboard, and then tack crossing the lane line below the top mark, uh, the Whitworth mark. And I think we will see the two Polish rounding the top mark first. So for once, we actually see starboard tack prove to be the winning move to get you around the Wimmer mark in first place. And there are the two poles absolutely side by side. And uh, the French really struggling at the back yes. now. So this is looking at the moment like a match race between Damasovic. Hopefully they're not going to mix the two Polish together. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a disaster, wouldn't it? We saw it yesterday with Wang and Pianozzi tie themselves in knots in a simultaneous jibe. But at the moment, there's nothing to choose between Damasovic and Wojciechowska. Damasovic possibly marginally ahead, but there's, there's absolutely nothing in it. Damasovic on the right and Wojciechowska on the left. Matching each other. Close, really close. They are super close. This Look is a fantastic competition between the top two Polish riders right now. And could this be the one that decides it? At the moment, it looks like the European title is going to go to Poland. But uh, which of these two poles is it going to be? Difficult to judge now. Vo and they, they know all of, all of those two. They know who is going to win. It's going to be the winner. That's right. Two bullet each, two and match point each. Marginal advantage on the left to Wojciechowska, just ahead of Yulia Dasamovic. Damasovic on the right. Oh, sketchy rounding. Oh, Damasovic hits the mark, Can't loses it. control, and it's advantage Wojciechowska. And that's a very good recovery by Damasovic, but... Is that the moment where she lost the youth European title? Now she finds herself in a battle back with the French, she, back with Eloise she slow down. She slowed down too much and then to avoid to get, uh, to touch the water with the board, to keep foiling, she went a little bit, ping up wind and then touched the mark. Oh, what a horrible moment for Julia Damasovic. She's still somehow managing to hold on to second place, but more importantly, Magda Wojciechowska has some clear air between her and the rest of the fleet. That's Wojciechowska tacking onto port, closely followed by Pigorier, and it's Damasovic, who is the last attack at the bottom of our screen. So it's actually very close. Pigorier has somehow closed the gap on Wojciechowska. It's still advantage Wojciechowska, but it, it's not done and dusted for her. No. Absolutely not, Dandy. This is very close between the front three. And Damasovic actually looks like she has slightly better wind where she is at the bottom of our screen. Because she went all the way out, so all the way out, and the wind, it seems that switch few more degree to the left. So it's an advantage for Julia if it's, if it's like that. Difficult to judge from here, just looking on the angle of the kite. Well, this is the moment, isn't it? I mean, is Damasovic going to be able to... Oh, oh is she going to pull this off? Damasovic, that is a great tack under pressure. And now the question for I her... I-mode, I-mode. She needs to go super I-mode. Wow. What an incredible rounding this would be if Julia Damasovic can get round in one go. Pumping, pumping the board. Pumping, pumping. Gets round but pays the price by being slow. So Wojciechowska takes the tactical advantage with a faster rounding, and it's Wojciechowska back in the lead again, followed by Pigorier. And Pigorier, she's got two poles to battle with here, the yellow bib wearer, all week, and right back in the battle. These three, whoever crosses the finish line out of these three in this race, whoever crosses first will become champion of Europe. Exactly. <laughs> it's enthusiastic. I must say, now every single move count, every single meter count. Damasovic has jibed at the bottom of the screen. Wojciechowska in the middle. And on the outside, it is Pigorier.
So Begorie at the top of your screen, Wojciechowska in the middle, and Wojciechowska is falling into the line of Begorie a little bit, but Julia Damasovic at the bottom of the screen is able to dictate when they jibe. I fear for a tangle of kites. Look at Begorie. Look at Begorie. She's trying to, to go low, low, low to block someone from leeward. And they're so close to the mark. Who's going to pull off the, the jibe at the moment? Pigorie has got through. Not such a good one by Damasovic. And Wojciechowska somehow has fallen back. How did Pigorie manage to do that? Eloise Pigorie is now in command. She's still got one more jibe to complete. But the two Polish riders have given her a bit of breathing space. Is this going to be the moment when the yellow bib wearer no. oh, crash down? by one of the poles, both of the poles. Pogorier, if she can keep a clean pair of heels across the finish line, Heloise Pogorier becomes the youth European champion. And could you imagine a more dramatic conclusion to the winning of that championship? A three-way battle. We thought it was going to go to Poland, but then Poland crashed and burned right at the end. What a thrilling final. <laughs> no one of us just got it from the beginning. We thought that the two Polish was an affair in Poland for the title, but at the end, from the third, Eloise, she just got this high speed, lower mode, and she just squeezed the two Polish inside of the mark, and then she just been able just to round the mark faster than them and put a lot of pressure, and then we see the outcome at the end. And Great, amazing move for Eloise. Absolutely amazing. And, and to come back from that UFD disqualification in the previous race, you've got to pick yourself up mentally and you've got to get your game face on again. Uh, she didn't have the best of starts. Actually, the start was okay, but she made the wrong choice on, on this occasion with the Mistral wind blowing, going out to sea like the Poles did. Starting on starboard was the way to go. And then at the end, Reville Chloe got second on this, which doesn't count, but obviously support for france <laughs> uh, amazing finish by the french riders in the end and such disappointment for poland who was so so close yeah that's really bad i was really betting and uh, sure that the polish would manage to one or the other uh, on the top of the podium but Eloise Pegorej, she just did the right move on the left side of the course, all the way to downwind. I mean, it was just about the last downwind leg. Uh, it was amazing. Just Absolutely about. amazing. Well, a quick break, and we'll be back to you soon to do a bit more analysis on that. We understand so that we, we should gave stand a by for to an um Poland umpire call for, for not giving mark room at the mark. So there's a, an umpire call that we need to. Uh, we gave a penalty to Poland for uh, for not giving mark room at the mark. Okay, so. Uh, we're waiting to hear confirmation of uh, whether those results are for definite. Um, I don't. I don't know. I thought they were, but uh, we're waiting to hear what the outcome of that is. That's what we think has happened. So we have Eloise Pigore on the three bullet, and Yulia Demasevich, and Magdalena Wojciechowska, and Chloe Reville. This is the result for the final. Right, someone was disqualified. 
Magda Wojciechowska was disqualified in the last race, and uh, so I don't know exactly the reasons why. Maybe it was that um, last Rounding rounding mark, yeah. at, at the last mark, but that has not changed the outcome that Eloise Bigorier is the youth European champion. So absolutely fantastic for her. Yeah, I mean, also from all week, the consistency of Eloise and then a little bit disappointed at the beginning of the final, but at the end she got the result. Yeah, so really, really well sailed by her. Um, and so we've had, we've had a really good week in Toro Grande, haven't we? A lot of race, uh, challenging condition, and the Mistral payoff again in this beautiful theater here in Torre Grande, which it seems to be the perfect place to do this kind of race. So um, I don't know if you can see from your vantage point, Mirko, how close they are to coming ashore. Yeah, I'm, I see all of uh, all of the um, finalists coming close to shore. I'm looking for uh, getting the the winner here, maybe in the boot. It was the plan. Okay, well, uh, go to a quick break and we'll be back to you soon, see if we can get that interview. Meet the R1V4, our highest performance Olympic and IKA registered racing machine. So Mirko has gone onto the beach to see if he can get our new uh, youth European champion, Heloise Pigorier. She's only just coming ashore now with her kite still in the air, but we're gonna see if we can get an interview with a winning French rider. So it's been a, uh, a fantastic week that we've had here and it's finished in the best possible way with the, um, uh, with the sunshine and the Mistral that we've had, but you can see she's still some, some way off from being able to join us in the booth. Um, we'll go to an ad and hopefully be able to get her soon. So here comes Eloise up to our booth, and she has had such a roller coaster of a ride today um, with that UFD disqualification for her being slightly over early in the previous race, and then managing to come through and overtake the two Polish riders. It, it so looked like it was going to go the way of Poland in that last race. And then she managed to come good right at the end. <laughs> Congratulations, Eloise. Uh, like this? Uh, yes, okay. like this. <laughs> Absolutely out of breath. Thanks for joining us. How do you feel? Uh, I'm exhausted and I'm very happy to finish the race. <laughs> uh, it was a really hard fight. Uh, hard fight. Sorry for my English. Um, and... Uh, I, I did a lot of mistakes on, on the first races and after I, I managed to come back but when I crossed the, the line of the finish line I saw the yellow flag I was like oh no please no and my coach said to me your black flag I was like no and I tried to do the same thing on the last race but it was a mistake because the wind turn and change and I saw Julia and Magda I was like, 
oh no, I have to come back really quick. And I did not, didn't know it was possible, but I try and finally I did it. So uh, I'm very happy. Absolutely unbelievable last race. Yeah. Would you mind taking your glasses off? Uh, sorry. Thank you. No, yeah, I mean, I, I can tell this means so much to you. Yeah. And during the races, I know that my dad's uh, looking at the live. So I was thinking I might die right to the to your life. And I was like, I have to do it for my dad. And so that's 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 what was going through your mind. And your mum is a big supporter here as well yeah, yeah. on the beach. Yeah, but I know my, my mum is so stressed on the beach that she don't look at all at the races. <laughs> so uh, I, I was thinking more about my dad than my mum. And when did you start to believe in that last race that you might actually be able to win it? Uh, I didn't know. I just I was just focused on myself and try to push the harder that I can and do only smart thing and not mistake anymore. And it was, I think it was a, a good thing because uh, the Polish girls the, uh, made, made a mistake. And with this mistake, I can come back again on the races. And after it was only me that can lead the race. So if I do not do did mistake, it was sure that I can win. And I was just thinking about that. And I was telling to myself, just, just focus on you, just focus on you and your kite. And uh, after when I finished the, the, the race, I was like, I didn't believe it. Like I asked to my friend and my coach, like, is it really true? Is it really true? They say, yes, yes, you win. <laughs> Did you dread seeing that yellow flag again, or were you were you fairly confident? No, no, no. I checked the yellow flag. There was no yellow, yellow flag. I was like, oh yes, yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely amazing! And you had a little bit more speed down the, the final run. Uh, you just seemed to have an extra gear that the Polish couldn't quite match you. How, uh, how did it feel from your um, side? Uh, on the last lap, yes, uh, yeah, uh, we were over lay line. So uh, with with this, I I put all my all my strength into the speed, only speed and not angle, and. It was a it was a good choice. It was a good choice. You you've sailed absolutely amazingly, and you've just given us one of the best ever finals that we've seen in a medal series. Yeah. Um, how are you going to celebrate? Um, I, I made a bet with my parents that if I win, I have a new dog. A so, new dog? Yeah. But you've got a lovely dog already. Why do you need a I new dog? Two, I want two dogs. So you there will be another dog. Yeah. Oh, right. I and win the bet, so normally, yes, I will have another dog. And, uh, of course, the dog's going to be called Torre Grande or Oristano or something like that. Uh, no? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine. My dad does not agree with, with this bet, but my mom said yes. And now I imagine my dad like this, like, <laughs> I have to have another dog. <laughs> so, uh, yes, so it, it's potentially quite an expensive day for your dad. I'm sure he'll be very happy. Yeah. But it's, uh, anyway, what kind of dog are you going to get? I don't know, but I want a big dog and not a small dog like Shari. Oh, right. Okay. So it's going to be expensive to maintain as well. So this has yeah. been a very important, expensive day for you, but one of the best days of your life, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry. Can you repeat, please? Uh, this must be one of the best days of your life. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is the best day of my life. The first time that I finish one into competition with Ika. So, so, so yeah, I'm really happy. You, yeah. Yeah. We can see how much this means to you. Heloise, thank you for giving us such an amazing final. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, we wait to hear what the name of the new dog will be sometime in the future. So, <laughs> um, good good luck with that, Dad. <laughs> you, you've got to you've got to get the wallet out after this. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Okay, can I? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So there we have it. We have our two youth European champions, uh, Riccardo Pianosi from Italy and Helo Eloise Pigorier from France after one of the most dramatic conclusions that we've ever seen. Mirko, let's, let's just conclude what we've just seen. That we, we saw the semi-finals earlier in the day. They were being wrapped up with, in just one race. And 
and sometimes it works out that way and uh, and then it makes you think oh are the finals going to go that way but actually that was that ended up being a very complex scenario and just one of the most entertaining races we've ever seen yes i must say uh, you know i i was running on to the beach to 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 get eloise and uh, see the the polish and all the amazing tension that was in the, in the beach between the winner and the loser that's amazing that means that the final in this way and the format again is really enthusiastic i don't have any other word is just amazing it is a great way to finish up the competition here. We've had a fantastic week. The Masters are going out to race their final races in the Masters World Championships. But uh, for us in Toro Grande, uh, for me, Andy Rice, Mirko Babini, and all of the team behind the scenes, we hope you've enjoyed today's competition in Toro Grande. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you on our next live stream coming up later this summer. See you then. See you. It is always better in the pool. It, it is, yeah. I mean, if in Formula One they do that, it's...